Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you're listening to the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us here today are Attica and Eno, so get ready and strap in. This week, aside from the political sideshows, was a rather slow news week. While the Russia dog and pony show dominates the headlines, while Trump's administration's antics continue, while the mainstream media continues to serve corporate interests to bury and spin the news, Congress has been busy. On the eve of the 86th anniversary of Antifa, which was formed in Berlin, Congress introduced a anti-Antifa bill to combat the growing threat of left-wing extremism in this country. And reporting on this, I have a special guest here today. Uh, Jimmy Dore's going to take over here uh, to describe this one for us. So let's get ready for this. Hey guys, it's Jimmy Dore here. I'm with Rob Cohn and the Miserable Liberal. I just kicked everybody off the podcast now. So... <laughs> Just kidding, you guys. Kidding. No, 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 keep doing. No, seriously, I want you. You, you're so, you are so good at Jimmy Dore. I, I can't do Jimmy Dore for the whole show, though. You should. Can we please do this? Look, this episode is. This news is so fucking shitty. Like, please, you have to do a new Jimmy Dore the whole episode. I, I, I can't do Jimmy Dore the whole episode. It, it hurts my throat to do it for too long of a time period. <laughs> uh, but basically what's happened here is that on the eve of the 86th anniversary of Antifa, which was formed in Germany back in 1932, Congress has drafted H.R. 6054, the Unmasking Antifa Act of 2018. What this bill does is it takes everything that's illegal to do at a protest and just makes it more illegal if you're wearing a mask. It's essentially a redundant bill aimed to target leftist protesters and mitigate black bloc tactics. However, because of the way that it's written, it is unconstitutional because it is targeting a movement. It's just designed to simply have a chilling effect on protesters using the black bloc technique, which many of them do for legitimate reasons, including concealing their identity so that right-wing protesters on the ground don't find out who they are and then dox them, basically put their information out on the web. There is a whole lot to unpack here, but before we even get into the the ugly minutiae of this incident, or rather this uh, this bill, I, I would like to point out that Phelan's characterizing of what's going on with the Russia scandal as a dog and pony show, I think is a bit of a mischaracterization. I would call it more of a political rodeo, because you got to realize that at this point, the Trump administration is effectively just a big, expensive, gaudy, bloated rodeo clown meant to distract from what's really going on behind the scenes. It's, I hate to drop this again, but it's the Society of the Spectacle Incarnate. And this anti-Antifa bill, you know how we feel about double negatives here. It's basically a dog whistle for explicitly pro-fascist. Of course, I mean, there's a very fast way of saying anti-Antifa, because Antifa just means anti-fascist. So if you're anti-anti-fascist, well, guess what? Congratulations, you played yourself. Now, the first thing that I'd like to unpack here, or just try to start discussing, is the sentence, which is a recommended 15 years. And given that this is a federal thing, that's going to be difficult to argue against in court and difficult to do a plea bargain with in court. Well, yeah, that's that's what this is really all about, is it's creating a minimum sentence with it's designed to scare liberals into not covering their face at protests, which... So it's designed to scare yeah. liberals. Yeah, cover their face in protests. Like my experience is, liberals show up and are surprised, and the police start punching them and gassing them and arresting them. Like I've never known liberals to cover their face, with the exception of apparently Tim Kaine's son. That that is actually a good point. I don't really see very many liberals covering up their face, and it actually might just be a good thing to practice, even if you're not doing anything violent or criminal, because there are people out there that are taking pictures of protests for the purpose of identifying protesters 
violent or non-violent so that they could track down these people and expose them in their minds and put all their information out on the web so that groups like 4chan and kiwi farms etc can go out and harass these people and so it's just a, a good way to mitigate that occurring because these groups are very vicious that's why i like that i have a motorcycle you know this isn't this isn't a riot helmet this is just my motorcycle helmet and there's nowhere for me to put on my motorcycle so i have to carry it with me these aren't eye protection these are these are my riding goggles you know oh, this isn't a mask you know i wear this because you know i'm driving through desert dirt and dust storms it's a good cover not to wax all tin foil hatty but i think that from a certain perspective, this might be perceived as the higher echelons of the conservatives and potentially, allegedly, possibly, theoretically, actual, gosh dang, fascists in the government to let their more explicitly and openly alt-right or fascist counterparts on the ground floor, just the rest of us regular citizens, to give them a leg up in their fight against Antifa, fighting on all fronts, you know? Since the lawmakers can't just come out and say, well, why not throw them all in gulag? They make it easier for the alt-right, who are private citizens, who are not beholden to the decorum expected of people who have government offices, to attack us basically on our own turf without the repercussions to their careers that would come with that. Well, that's exactly what this is, is basically they're allowing the citizens to do the work. In this case, when I say the citizens, I mean the, the, the Red Hat Army here of MAGA forces to have their way with whomever they like. And this is just greenlighting that, basically, because they know that they can't have the cops get away with everything. They know that they can't send out the guard and just initiate martial law. No, that's just not possible for them, at least right now anyway. So they get their foot soldiers on the ground to do stuff. And then, of course, they could denounce it when something really bad happens and you know somebody gets killed or whatever. They can just say, well, I never endorse that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how useful were the brown shirts to the rise of the Third Reich? And as we've established, while there are parallels, it would be disingenuous to call them brown shirts. They're mostly white wife beaters, right? Ooh. Honestly, it's just mostly gaudy. Their uniforms can just be called gaudy. I've, yeah, I've seen what they do battle in. And quite frankly, they should be embarrassed. Hey, I like the look of an IBA. Thank you very much. I think they look like like rejects from a Stan Lee comic. See, I find it interesting, though, that this is about face masks, not personal protective gear, not assault rifles, not body armor, not sticks or clubs or shields for close in combat meant to crack skulls, break bones and loosen morale. It's just about masks. It's specifically targeting nonviolent protesters or potentially nonviolent protesters or protesters who are not explicitly violent, who just want to remain anonymous, rather than people who actually go to these large public events with weapons in order to brandish them and intimidate people, or worst case scenario, in order to use them on people. I would say that with the idea that Antifa is this terrible left-wing militia sleeper cell terrorist organization, that in order to have a real anti-Antifa bill at the higher levels of government, you would try to outlaw assault weapons or body armor not unlike the stuff that uh alt-right protest oh i get it that was also the double standard that i noticed there as well is that they're banning the masks but there's no real mention made of anything else and the bill's called the anti-antifa bill no mention of the alt-right there in any of their antics so one is just left with the conclusion that obviously this is a one-sided illegal attack here. Well, there is one exception to mask wearers to this bill, and to be fair, it's not the alt-right. Who do you think the exception to this bill is? Hmm, that that's a good, good question. Uh, I'm going Who to- Who wears masks to protests? I, I'm going to say it's not food vendor. No, 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 they don't, they don't wear masks. Journalists? No, no. I'm, I'm going to say cops. Is it cops? That is correct. It is police officers. Now, one way they're going to try to mask this is they're going to <laughs> mask this. Gosh. 
One way they're going to try to mask this, if it gets brought up in discussion about this bill, is uh, those masks are required for the personal protection of our officers. If it goes further than that, they're probably going to say something along the lines of, well, you don't have the right to know the officers engaging in riot pacification or crowd control activities for their safety and anonymity because, you know, blue lives matter. Which actually is unprecedented because it is has always been at least historically required that an officer identify themselves even if they have their badge covered up. And I believe it's even unlawful for an officer if asked undercover if they're a cop to lie, correct? Uh, that's incorrect. That's something that was invented by uh, television show writers to raise the drama of any given scene. Oh, now I'm sad. I do know that it is required if they're in uniform that they give their badge number and everything, that they can't refuse to do that. That is a requirement, but ask my father who, when he worked dope, his, his undercover outfit was an Eddie Van Halen t-shirt, a pair of cut-off denim shorts, and uh, Smith & Wesson 4566 tucked into his waistband worn openly. How do you do, fellow drug dealer? So, so you know, the funny thing yeah. is, is when you told this story, I thought that your dad was a cop in 1982. What year was he doing this in? Uh, working smack in Bernie, 93-ish. Wow, he, he did arrive late to the party. <laughs> Eddie Van Halen t-shirt cut off. Oh, gosh, I mean, the gay in me just wants to... All right, so... Another thing that we need to unpack with this bill is the language used and the fact that the majority of the language used are not clearly defined legal terms. If you could explain that to us in greater depth, please. So what's going on here with the language is that, like you said, a lot of these terms in the bill are not legally defined. They use terms that we use in common speech, uh, like oppress and intimidate, which sound like words that we would know the meaning of, but don't really have legal definitions, at least within the US code. This creates a problem because they can use this to kind of bend the meanings of those words. So oppressing and intimidating somebody could literally just be interpreted as one protester shouting down another counter protester. And of course, it's very easy to see where this is going. And since the law is written so that if you're wearing a mask and you're oppressing or intimidating somebody in said mask, having an argument with the counter protester at that point could place you in violation of the law. And of course, it's not inconceivable to imagine that an argument might break out between two people at a protest. Theoretically, someone on either side could just go over to one of the police officers and say, excuse me, fine young gentleman of wealth and taste wearing military grade combat armor. That fellow over there is oppressing me with their sign. The size of their sign is intimidating and that is oppressing to me and I need you to sort that out. And if the police officer in question happens to be amenable to the cause or ideals of the person fomenting the complaint in question, they might very well be legally justified in grabbing that person, charging them with oppression, which is because of this bill, now a thing that you can be locked up for, throwing them in the paddy wagon and having them locked up in a federal prison for 15 years for the mere crime of oppressing somebody with the size of their sign. Now, of course, this is a hyperbolic scenario, but tell me that we don't live in a world made of hyperbolic scenarios right now. And then the other dangerous aspect of all of this is Antifa is not even an organization. It's a movement. One is not really a member of Antifa. For them to target Antifa in this way, it's like saying I'm going to be targeting liberals, uh, for instance. It's targeting a position, not an organization, because there's no central Antifa office or anything like that. There's there's not even really a lot of agreement on everything that Antifa believes in other than really anti-fascism. The problem here with this all is, is because it's targeting a movement, it makes it easy to just accuse somebody of being Antifa and then using this law or law similar to this in the future that may be written to crack down on them. Uh, another amusing, amusing fact in that light is that similar laws already exist in many states. On the state level, 
that were written initially to expose the KKK, who engaged in mass terror campaigns and marches about midway through the century around the country. And a lot of those laws that exist on the state level are specifically for rooting out a hate organization, an organization with a hierarchy and leaders and planning committees, etc. Right. And the whole grand irony of this is that while the government and Congress is busy writing all of these bills about the dangerous leftist terror threat in this country, the actual statistics have shown just within the past 10 years, the ADL did statistics ranging from 2009 to 2017, and they found that 71% of all deaths from terror attacks in this country came from white supremacist groups. Only 3% of those deaths were linked to leftist groups in that same time period. Zero were committed by Antifa, by the way. The rest of them was basically just Islamic terror. Leftist organizations are pretty much the least threat to, <laughs> as far as extremism goes. It, it is so rare to have a leftist terror attack in this country. And yet we're reporting hate crimes now. Almost every episode, there's at least two or three of them. And if you broaden it to police brutality, that number just skyrockets. But of course, they don't include that in, in the statistics. An interesting thing to note in that context is that the technical definition of a lynching, a the, the legal definition of a lynching, is an extra legal killing of somebody who is suspected of committing a crime, usually undergone by a community, but not in every case. In that context, you could characterize every police shooting of a suspect, armed or unarmed, who is not explicitly seen committing a crime by a number of witnesses as a lynching. Now, lumping lynchings in with white supremacist terror attacks that have happened in the past two-thirds of a century, you might very well say that the majority of them were individual cases of police gun violence. So you would think with all of this terror that the right wing commits, that governments would be interested in doing something about it, maybe creating a database of dangerous individuals, maybe investigating these crimes just a little bit better. But you'd actually be wrong, not in the United States, but across Europe. A recent G20 meeting concluded it was necessary for them to create a black bloc task force where law enforcement and intelligence offices would share information gathered on leftist organizations. And this is pretty much a broad scope targeting anyone from environmentalists to communists to anarchists, anything that they deem left wing and extreme. And historically, you can see some context for that. The tragedy of the Zed just a couple of months ago and how environmentalists have in the past engaged in acts of direct terrorism, you can see the reasoning behind it when you compare it to the amount of right-wing terror attacks that have occurred all over the world. I'm not just talking about white supremacists in America. I'm not just talking about uh, religious, religious fundamentalists. I'm, I'm talking about right-wing ideology in general, that which espouses that Power in the hands of a few individuals who are unsympathetic to the desires of others is what this species needs to guide it forward. Those ideologies tend toward extreme acts of violence and terror, and we have seen it time and time again in a huge number of organizations. And to top that off is what is considered extreme by this definition, because what they're actually doing is they're using the for the most part, it's Germany leading this. So they're using their definition of extremism, which is pretty much just any belief that isn't constitutionally recognized by their government, which throws in communists and anarchists as being the moral equivalent to right-wing Nazis and fascists. So on the surface, uh, w without knowing any more than the fact that it's anything that's not constitutionally recognized, that sounds like the state in power saying if you espouse any beliefs or any political ideologies that are not directly endorsed by the state you are a political radical uh, that's actually exactly what they're getting at there 
Germany has this really weird precedent where their government actually investigates the positions of parties and they can actually disqualify parties for having certain positions that that are deemed extremist and outside the the German constitution. Given their history with extremist parties, you couldn't call that unjustified. I just think it a little ironic that yet again, the great German government is having problems with anti-fascist organizations. It seems like they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater here, ideologically speaking, of course. And the other thing that this kind of echoes as well, I'm really feeling that this is disturbingly very similar to COINTELPRO in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in the United States, which was a program initiated by the FBI to infiltrate and sabotage numerous left-wing groups of many different types of persuasions, everything from the Black Panthers to uh, the Students for Democracy to uh, the, the Weathermen to just peaceful protests. And pretty much if it was left-wing, they were, they were all over it. But it also has, because of its aggressive nature and because it does seem like a very active process here, because it, it is a task force and they're actually using it to raid people. This sounds like it could be a little bit like Gladio too, where they may be setting people up uh, for things. So basically like engaging in false flag events as well to pin down and villainize Antifa and other groups in Europe. Which is something that the alt-right has been busted talking about here in the United States. Yeah, well, this is, the exception being this is European governments talking about doing this, which really is, is not historically unprecedented if you, if you look at the history with Gladio and whatnot, where the United States government actually was involved with that and helped frame numerous communist parties with terrorist attacks by supplying materials and then sometimes even just having people go out undercover and commit them. Uh, bad angle, lukewarm take. The alt-right in the United States is full of feds. COINTELPRO all over again. They're just being more overt about it. You would think that with their obsession with false flags, but... I think that that's more that that's the only tactic they know. So they just keep repeating it. They don't really seem like the most tactful of, of the bunch, to be honest. I did say bad angle, lukewarm take, hon. But we do have a lot of incidents of right wing terrorism in the United States, not necessarily being frowned upon by the government to the extent that you would think it would be. Oh, you mean like that time in Oregon, just right down the road from where I live? Yeah, that guy got pardoned, by the way. I don't know if you heard about that. What was his name? Stephen Dwight uh, Hammond? Yeah. Which is surprising, but unsurprising. I mean, Arpaio got pardoned, and look where that's leading us with the camp situation. Look at the level of right-wing terror being wholly unaddressed by this government. And just kind of connect the dots. And you can see it's it's not really a huge leap of logic, this pardon here. It's particularly disturbing because this is going to embolden right-wing groups. This is basically just giving militias the green light to do what they do. This was well-deserved. The guy had his sentence commuted, basically, uh, originally down from the maximum five years to one year for Stephen and then three months for Dwight. They challenged it. They dragged it out. A prosecutor came back and said, well, you know, if you want to fight it and everything, we're just going to give you the book. And then that's when they took over the bird sanctuary. They have a history of not only arson, because they, they committed the arson back in 2006, but there was another fire that they committed before that in 2001. So some time has passed since the events. But the other thing is, is they also threatened federal officers numerous times throughout the 80s and 90s with threats that, quite frankly, if it would have been you or I would have made to a law enforcement, we would have been placed in jail. It seems like these people were pretty interested in threatening others with live firearms as they effectively held an armed revolt in a local town. 
not so much an armed revolt as a, a demonstration with loaded weapons uh, wandering through the streets, I imagine. It wasn't in the local town, per se. They took over a nearby bird sanctuary that's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and they held that for about 41 days. But they did go into town from time to time, and apparently they did have some altercations with the locals, like arguments and, and whatnot, because the situation was getting out of hand. A lot of the locals just wanted them at that point to turn themselves in because it was it was causing a problem for the town and drawing attention that they didn't didn't really want. Unmarked helicopters flying overhead, end times preachers stumbling around the streets. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it must have been awful. Plus, periodically being visited by crazed bearded men with assault rifles. I can't understate how uncomfortable that makes most people. And you know what is interesting about the entire pardon is how it kind of occurred. Because the group that worked with Mike Pence to do it is called Protect the Harvest. They're actually funded by a former oil executive named Forrest Lucas. If he sounds familiar, if you're a sports fan, he owns the Indianapolis Colt, uh, which is an NFL team. Protect the Harvest worked out a pardon deal through Pence, and then Pence went to Trump with the case, and then Trump, of course, pardoned the ranchers. The problem here, of course, is, is that because of the nature of, of what went down, the fact that they had an armed revolt on federal land for 41 days, and were having altercations with people in the nearby town, this really should not be acceptable. They definitely do deserve the full sentence on, on this one. This is not something that they should have been allowed to get away with because this is just telling other other right-wing groups now that they can go out and they could do the same thing and they're going to get pardons too or they're just not going to be punished for whatever they're doing. Well, aside from the armed revolt and threatening townspeople, let's be fair, showing up in town with rifles, did they not start an actual wildfire so as to cover up the effects of uh, their poaching? That's the crime that they actually committed. So what they did was, is back in 2006, this is when the actual crime occurred, uh, they were out poaching on federal land and they didn't want to get caught, so they burned down the forest where they were hunting. And their failing to show up for their sentencing is what led to this debacle. I, I, I see. Yeah, exactly. It's not just the fact that that's, that's what they did. It's the fact that they had the sentence commuted, then challenged it anyway. And then when they get the entire book slammed at them because the judge doesn't want to hear it anymore, they did everything that they could to basically try to get off with the crime this is not like a small crime in Oregon. We have a huge wildfire problem here. I live in Oregon and I will tell you that the wildfires here are no joke. They're actually a health hazard because the smoke can get so thick. And luckily this year it's been okay. But if it starts up again this year, it might actually be worse than it was last year. And last year was disabilitating. How, how much have you heard about the most recent high-profile police shooting? You actually sent that across my desk just hours before the show started. I didn't have a lot of time to look into it. What I was able to figure out from it from context here is this guy was walking out of a Walgreens. Cop approached him. It sounds like they were asking him a few questions. He got into an argument with her over selling loose cigarettes, which it doesn't sound like he was doing at the time, according to a witness that watched the whole thing go down. The cop basically tried to chicken wing him, as, as you called him, to put the handcuffs on him. He pushed her away and started running. And that's uh, when he got shot in the back about eight times. Uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, one Harith Augustus, he was accosted by the police in one report because he was exhibiting the traits of an armed individual, I believe. Yes, and he apparently had a gun on him at the time, and according to the video, it looks like... Which, I mean, yeah. that's a serious but still fairly broad accusation. Uh, he, he could have been profiling or something. 
Um, as it turns out, he was armed at the time, and he doesn't have a concealed carry license, but as far as I know, he legally owned the firearm and was not a felon. That's kind of a legal gray area, but at the time that he was accosted either for selling loose cigarettes, as the altercation allegedly was about, or for exhibiting the signs of an armed person, the police didn't know at that time that he was armed. And I don't know anything about the altercation. Fortunately, Chicago police released the video fairly expediently, less than 24 hours after the incident transpired. The, the video runs less than a minute is from the perspective of one body cam and doesn't include sound. So without the context, w without understanding how and why the altercation escalated, to use their flowerly legal language, it's impossible to know why she made a quick grab for his arm because it didn't seem like she was going through the motions of Mirandizing him or asking him to sit down on a curb and put his hands behind his back. It seems like she just, from behind him, made a quick and aggressive grab for his arm and he reacted instinctively by trying to pull away. And when the other police officers began to move toward him, he seemed to panic and try to get away. Yeah. And it seemed underhanded and hasty. Like they were just looking for somebody to to arrest or whatever. And they absolutely got their somebody to something because in the fray, he got pushed up against the car by the police officer whose body cam footage was released. And at that point, his shirt got pulled up and it is very clear that he was wearing a firearm and extra ammunition for it. At that point, he rolled off the car and ran. That's what preceded his being shot several times in the street. And the interesting thing about this entire case here is not even necessarily that it's it's just another police shooting. It's actually what happened afterwards because I've never seen a re community response like this. So within 10 minutes of the shooting, basically, there was a full protest out on the street with people just surrounding the police officers and yelling at them. Like, this is unprecedented. Who do you protect? Who do you serve? Was, was one of the slogans that was being chanted, which I think if there are any good apples in this particular basket, must have shook them to their core because really at this point, how can you justify this kind of behavior? Again, within 10 minutes, there were, by one journalist's count, approximately 100 people surrounding a line of, just from my having looked at the pictures they took, uh, two or three dozen cops. And allegedly, uh, about five minutes after this crowd formed, the police officer who was engaged in the shooting was rushed into a car and driven away. It seems that in this case, they know they were in the wrong. And even though in the body cam footage, this could go either way in court, and you could, in bad faith, argue that mistakes were made on his part and on the officer's part, it seems that the Chicago Police Department does know that they done goofed this time. Not like they'll ever pay for it. Like, literally the only good, the reason I'm being so quiet is because, you know, this is the only good news. The only good news is that when someone got shot today, it took like three minutes for a crowd of 100 people to form. And they actually aren't putting, weren't putting up with the shit, and they threw stuff at the police. The, the only good news is that things are accelerating in terms of people are not putting up with bullshit. It was pretty much like that scene from V from Vendetta with the girl, and she has the mask on, and the police officer shoots her, and everybody surrounded the police officers. And that is something that, unfortunately, I think we need at this point. We do need more immediate, aggressive, no-holds-barred action from entire communities coming together. We need accountability on the ground with this sort of thing because we're obviously not seeing it in the court system. Well, They, they, the, they say that a full investigation yeah. is, is, is underway for this shooting, but... We know that. Yeah, that means they're hiding evidence. It was the police, though, that did actually start the violence when the crowd formed. I mean, the it's article It's always the police that it, starts the violence. Well, yeah, they, they started pushing the, the, the crowd and everything, throwing punches. Like, they were the first people to throw punches. There's no such thing as an unpeaceful protest. All those protests start peacefully, then the police tear gas people. Then someone throws the tear gas canister back to the police and suddenly it's all oh, they're violent protesters. And then they just start fucking massacring people and call it a quote, violent protest as justification. And the news just goes along with it. 
according to the journalist whose Twitter feed a lot of this initial information is coming from, he had his press pass out visibly, waving it in his hand, and his phone in his other hand recording and uh, trying to get closer and ask people questions and conduct interviews when a police officer knocked the phone out of his hands and that police officer and another allegedly pushed him to the ground. It seems like there was a lot of reactive violence on the side of the police who were trying to cordon off the area. Yeah, they, they wanted to shut down the protest as soon as possible, it would seem. And interestingly enough, earlier today, before we got on air here, there was another protest that was peaceful as well. It was just basically a march. And the police actually put a stop to that, too, and had them shut it down and, I, I'd assume, threaten violence uh, to make them all go home. And, of course, that needs a little bit of clarifying. In the context of police in America, threatening violence is as simple as putting a police officer or two on the corner. A police officer is, right now, in the current political state we're in, a police officer is a threat of violence. The job of the police is to enforce the law, often using violence. And by enforce the law, it's really just enforcing the interests of the moneyed and propertyed people. Do you mean the militarized strong arm of a plutocratic authoritarian state? I mean, really, at this point, they're pretty much just localized version of the military-industrial complex. Ooh, that's a nasty take, but I'm not going to sit here and disagree with it as much as I'd like to. It seems like, as we touched on and alluded to earlier, that a lot of the hate crimes that we're dealing with are coming from the police. But, unfortunately, that's not our only source. Oh, yeah, and that wasn't the only hate crime that happened in this country, of course. I mean, it happens all the time. But there was one really notable and really nasty case that did emerge this week. A African-American woman beat up a... 91 year old Mexican grandfather and yelled at Wait, him. Wait, an African American woman beat up? Yes, yeah. yes, re read the notes. Um, it's not supposed to happen. It, it's not supposed to happen, but it, it happens more than you'd like it to. That's this is this is how the the elites keep us down. They they divide us up and have each other fighting over it. Just look at how uh, like legal Hispanics don't like the illegal Hispanics, supposedly, you know, that that kind of thing. It's it's definitely well, yeah. a thing. It's a very popular alt right talking point. You'll find it in a lot of their chat rooms. You'll find it talking to your friendly Republican neighbor. Oh, man, you have no idea, though. Racism isn't just coming from whites. In fact, whites are the least racist people I know. You ever seen how much Filipinos hate the Japanese? You know how much African Americans hate Mexicans? It's a very common talking point, and that talking point is rooted solely in the efforts of the ruling class to divide the proletariat against themselves, against each other. We do hear this in other fashions, too. Uh, another one that they like to throw around is, uh, there's no such thing as LGBT because all of those things hate each other. <laughs> so you're right. It, it's a talking point to divide solidarity and break it up so that everybody's fighting everybody else. But getting back to this, this guy was just going out for a walk, and what happened was, is he, he's older, so he's, he's kind of, he, he may have been bumbling around a little bit, but he, he bumped into this lady's daughter, and she just basically flipped her ass over the entire situation, and started throwing punches at the guy and screaming at him, and then she took a brick out of her purse and started beating the guy with it, which, I don't know, who carries brick in their purse these days maybe her husband is a wealthy mason there was a witness there that was able to record it they called 911 and everything it did all the things you'd expect now they did try to actually intervene because like the one thing you always hear about this is like why why don't people try to intervene well this lady uh her name was uh miss bell borjas she did try to intervene and she got up to the person and the person said, yo, you come over here and interrupt me. I'm going to hit you with this brick too. And so she basically backed off after that, not wanting to get hit by the brick. And apparently there were some people watching as well from across the street that also came over and then started joining in on beating this guy up, yelling at him, calling him a pedophile. This is heartbreaking and unbelievable and terrifying all at the same time. 
This is like, like, do you remember like when you said, do you know what the legal definition of a lynching is? And it, it's basically just a mob trying to extrajudicially execute the law, basically. This is essentially what this is. The problem with all of that is, is that oftentimes, a majority of the time, no crime has actually been committed. Like, this guy did nothing wrong. All he did was accidentally bump into somebody on the street, and this could have been something that, that you or I could have done, but because of his race, he was brutally beaten for it. I know that this is a topic that we need to discuss whenever it comes up, because it's something that we as a culture cannot afford to forget or sweep under the rug, but can we get on to a less depressing topic like the cartoonish evil of the Nestle Corporation? Not so much Nestle this time, maybe, perhaps, we don't really know because we don't have proof. But yeah, let's talk about the history first of this, just to kind of, so that we can unpack all of this. So, back in the 1970s, there was something called the Nestle Infant Formula Scandal. Some of you people may, may know what I'm talking about here. During the 1970s, Nestle marketed infant formula to women in nurses' outfits in hospitals across the country. And in fact, they even still do this in, ho in hospitals today in developing nations. What would basically happen is this formula is really expensive and they're giving out these free samples. And it turns out after about a month of using the free samples, the mother would stop producing breast milk and the person that was getting the free samples, of course, would be cut off from getting free samples and have to purchase this. Now, in 1970 dollars, this formula cost seven dollars a week for a single infant. So this was pretty expensive stuff at the time because it was so expensive and because it was marketed to pretty much everybody, including people that didn't have the ability to cough up this kind of money. What would happen would be oftentimes these people would dilute the formula down, assuming that they even had safe water to dilute it from. And the babies would die from malnutrition. It was reported in 1982 that there were a million deaths every year from that time dying from infant formula due to malnutrition. That's not a flat number on malnutrition deaths in infants worldwide. That is infants dying of malnutrition as a result of the, the poorly mixed and heavily diluted formula, correct? And also other, other problems because tap water or just whatever water was being used at the source oftentimes had chemicals in it that were disruptive to the development of infants or maybe it wasn't as clean, it had bacteria in it, etc. That all kind of contributes to that. Breast milk itself is formulated in such a way that it contains like everything a baby needs to survive and then some. It's it's basically a whole nutritional food for the infants. You know, imagine that, that evolution would be that effective, if you will. I don't care how good you are at science, you're not going to effectively argue with a couple hundred million years of hominid evolution. Thank you very much. But even past the logic of that, we have hard data supporting the fact, the concrete scientific fact that breastfed infants are healthier than infants who are on formula. Not only are they healthier, uh, it turns out that if your infant is breastfed within the first six months, they have a five to ten times less chance of dying. So the mortality rate quickly drops there and that number is just staggering. So that really does tell you that there is something there. And it is recommended by physicians that outside of edge cases where the mother can't produce milk, that yes, they should breastfeed their kids. The, the reason for that is, is not only is it a nutrient thing, breast milk also contains antibodies, which help babies become resistant to certain bacterial and viral diseases. Particularly environmental threats. The mother will have developed these immunities because of the threats that she faces in her environment every single day. For instance, a mother in Africa is going to deal with a different range of microbes and viri 
that will affect her and affect the baby. So she's going to develop antigens that specifically guard against those. And therefore, that is going to be passed through her breast milk to her infant child. Right. So it, in many ways, it kind of works a lot like vaccinating your kids. I mean, that's pretty, pretty much what this is. Now, again, there are cases in which a mother cannot breastfeed and does, in fact, need formula. But this being marketed to and pushed on people who didn't know any better and didn't actually need it, it almost seems like if you have a very lucrative product and you're trying to sell it to everyone, irrespective of whether or not they need it, and you give them small doses for free to make them dependent on it and then begin charging them as soon as they're, they're dependent upon it, that seems like it would be illegal in certain contexts, don't you think? It, it should be. This is basically the the business model of a drug dealer. This is the business model of the guy that sells you heroin. Hey, have this little baggie here or whatever. I don't do heroin. I don't know what it looks like. Snort it up, inject it, whatever. <laughs> um, have fun. And then, you know, a week or two later, however long it takes to get hooked, then all of a sudden it's, hey, you, you want this? Uh, well, it's going to be $100 now. Well, you can't compare them to drug dealers. It's it's not as if they have employees waiting outside of business places where their demographic frequents, right? They were banned from hospitals in many countries. So before, like I said, they would have people in nurses' outfits, you know, hand them cans of formula and, you know, give them tips on, on mothership, as they called it, and everything. And that's how they would get people kind of hooked on the formula. Now what they do, because a lot of countries have banned this practice, there will be somebody in a nurse's outfit or whatever right outside the hospital waiting for the mo new mothers to come out. I just imagine some dick in a fedora and a trench coat loitering outside of a hospital as, as soon as a new mother and her husband and their infant child walk out to their car, he, he runs them down and accosts them. Ma'am, ma'am, I see you've got, I see you've got a, a, a new, a newborn child there. Now I'll bet your nipples are already sore from all that breastfeeding. I'm sure you've done in there, and I've got this wonderful new solution that you might like to hear about. Let me tell you about infant formula. <laughs> Just yes, exactly. It's so the reason that we're bringing this up is because the UN World Health Assembly voted on a resolution upholding 40 years of studies supporting breast milk as the best food for infants. The resolution was to limit misleading and inaccurate claims from companies marketing this formula because oftentimes these companies would lie about the capabilities or even contents of these formulas. Basically, to set in stone legal precedent on which to predicate legislation that prohibits these companies from using misleading and inaccurate claims in their marketing campaigns, trying to steer people toward their product and away from what is objectively the best solution to those who can provide it. So basically what's going on here is that several countries already were prepared to implement this resolution and everything. And the United States went to one of those countries, one of the more vulnerable ones, Ecuador, and said, well, you know, if you implement these policies, we might just have to withdraw aid and restrict trade here with your country, which of course forced Ecuador to back down because the United States is one of their biggest trade partners and their government is having some issues on their borders with some of the violence that's spilling out from Colombia with the gangs. Of course, they're going to be concerned if the U.S. government withdraws military aid. So Ecuador actually backed down. And then after Ecuador backed down, a whole slew of other mostly Latin American nations backed down from the resolution as well. Not very surprising showcase of the fabled and reviled domino effect. Now, we've seen things like this allegedly occurring at the behest of large corporations who have a financial interest in such actions being undertaken by the United States military industrial complex. 
the decision did actually manage to get reversed, but it took Russia putting their foot down to stabilize the situation so that these countries could actually implement these resolutions, which is an interesting take. But the, the other thing is, is that these companies, Nestle had representatives there. You would imagine it wouldn't be too surprising if, if they had maybe influenced it or had heard what was going on and, and got with their buddies in the United States. But to Nestle's admission, supposedly anyway, if they are to be believed, they didn't lobby the government to do it. The government, the U.S. government, seemed to actually know exactly what they needed to do. Exactly. It it seems like historically these actions being undertaken has led to such a well-oiled machine that the government doesn't necessarily need to work hand in hand with these large companies with financial interests. They just do it automatically. I mean, you hear about old couples having that mind reading ability where they just know what the other needs. The government just threatening to engage in these in these very hostile actions against these very vulnerable countries, allegedly at the behest of these companies that have a stake in this hashtag couples goals, you know? Yeah, and speaking of hashtag couples goals here, we got an LGBT rights story here for you. Republicans, do I even have to say Republicans? Like, we all know who did it. Like, I guess for clarity yes so no we've we've got to facetiously <laughs> flip the script sometime just to keep it interesting guess who the democrats now hate the gays just kidding it's still the republicans yes yes exactly so republicans voted to make it legal nationwide to basically ban gays from adopting now I want to caveat this because that's actually not the story. This is the, the story yeah, that's being let's thrown. Qualify yeah, that. that's okay. Because this is this is what we keep hearing. I want to qualify it with what the actual story is because it's actually a little bit more insidious and nefarious. So it's not an outright ban. What they did was they passed an amendment to a funding resolution. So this is the government approving funding for adoption institutions, states, and local government. What it actually says is, is that somebody working for an adoption agency can basically refuse to process your paperwork based off of religious ground. This is a religious freedom argument that they're going with here on this one, which of course we see all the time when it comes to infringing on the rights of LGBT people. Oh, this same song and dance. Let me ask you to clarify here. It is not a blanket ban on LGBT couples adopting so basically what this means is let's say a lesbian couple for example tries to adopt a child the adoption agency based off of religious grounds or even somebody that just works there can refuse to file paperwork now if they don't honor this so if a locality passes a law stating equal rights no you're not going to interfere with this or if a adoption agency decides well, it's, it's not company policy. They can go work anywhere else but here if they want to do this. If that happens, if it's a state or local government, they get a 15% dock on their funding for these adoption facilities. And if it's the agency, they can lose all of their federal funding. So basically, this is just using federal funding as a way to implement law without actually making law. Again, the cudgel of the state has a fat dollar sign printed on it. This is not surprising. So what you're saying is that this is not a blanket ban on LGBT couples adopting. What it is, is a system that makes it basically impossible for an adoption agency that is in any way federally funded to compel any of the people who work for that organization to process paperwork that needs to be processed for LGBT couples. Yes, that is absolutely correct. As practical applications are concerned, I fail to see the difference because this just means that religious rights advocacy groups can just kind of plant an employee in every state level federally funded adoption agency and have a conscientious objector in every office that needs paperwork to go through their hands, this conscientious objector can flatly deny the paperwork to any of these hopeful couples and therefore 
take the entire process for these these particular couples to a grinding halt and make it practically impossible for them to legally adopt. You got it. That's exactly what they're trying to do. That sounds like a blanket ban with extra steps. It's because they can't do the thing that they want to do because there would be too much opposition to it. So they basically just go around it using these kind of tactics and then calling it freedom. I mean, this is this is old hat for these people. When the mean old liberals take away your bullhorn, so you've got to use a dog whistle. We need to be paying more attention to this kind of tactics because this is the exact kind of tactics that we can expect in the future from this camp. Whenever we see these kind of things, it's still important that we report on it and we report accurately because if we don't report accurately, these same people are going to come out and, of course, call us liars. It's, it's one of those kind of things that we do have to be very, very careful about. I don't understand, like, who's adopting? Millennials can't even afford houses. We can't afford families. We can't even afford new cars from this decade. It's great that you ask who's adopting. It actually turns out that there is a great need for people that are willing to adopt kids. And it also turns out that LGBT people are more willing to adopt kids. And to top it off, guess which person, queer or straight, is more likely to be in a stable relationship in a stable household. Gay men. Yes. Oh, so the men the, the, you men. Yes, the queen. Gay men specifically. Actually, LGBT people in general actually have more stable relationships with each other than straight people do. They are far less likely to divorce. That's a whole like thing that you you hear about like religious people and their objections. They're like, oh, you know, you, you got to have the mother and the father because it, it promotes stability in the family and stuff. But then it turns out that longitudinal studies show time and time again that they straight think we're still like, you know, in our forties at the bar at the glory hall, you know, and they just imagine that the kids waiting outside or something like. Like, they think it's still the 70s. That's actually a very good point and an angle that I haven't really considered the whole wealthy baby boomers versus any level of saga individuals. That's not really an angle that I've considered this from. But yeah, uh, a lot of the older media representation of, of saga individuals, particularly gay men, is depravity and degeneracy that you would think is inherent to homosexual men or indeed any saga individual, but was actually a result of the material conditions that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna politely to stop you right there, uh, because I, I don't know what the term is. Could you define saga for me? I don't know what that is. It's sexuality and gender acceptance. It's uh it's Oh, okay. In, I, I'm in, in sorry. my opinion a better umbrella term because LGBT only includes lesbian, gay, bi, and trans, but then you tack queer on there, then you tack intersex on there, then you tack ally on there, and you could make an alphabet soup that becomes all-inclusive until some new term is happened upon by the people who put a great deal of thought and energy into this. I think it's it's more effective to have an umbrella term, and I, I know that this is a somewhat di divisive subject I, 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 I in a get... lot of... I like that, but I'm not going to speak to it because I, I'm a straight white male and I feel that I don't really have a place to determine that. So I'll, I'll leave that to both of you two. <laughs> I'm just fond of umbrella terms that leave no one out and try to offend no one. I've, I've seen a lot of discourse in the LGBT community that tries to overtly or subversively exclude certain members of the community again the whole facetious drop the b campaign or the very real exclusion of aces that's uh, a asexuals from it saying that a in the lgbtqia stands for allies or the the q doesn't stand for queer because queer is a slur the q stands for or the uh the 4chan opt to add p to it yes there's a lot of flack being thrown around by a lot of different interest groups that I personally don't care to jump in on because 
even as someone in that community, I'm not the most well-educated and I'm simply not willing to commit that much time and energy and vitriol to a I subject. I just want to fucking suck cock and, and tit at the same time. Like, why does... Why, why do I say that? <laughs> just shut up. I, just Jeez, want I did not expect that one, from you. I just want to be able to have one good umbrella term for this entire community that I adore and appreciate and hope the best for that doesn't exclude or offend anyone. And so far, Saga has fit the bill for me. It's a very simple concept. It doesn't require you to be lesbian or gay or bi or trans. It doesn't ask for allyship. All it simply means is sexuality and gender acceptance. It's a very simple concept, and I think in that simplicity, and its modularity as an umbrella term, it is very powerful. And getting back to all this, the science behind it is already decided. However, science has really never changed the opinion of the critics here. Let's, let's be honest. Well, of course it has. That's why we have effective legislation against climate change and gun violence. Yeah, about that. <laughs> oh gosh, Phelan, please don't break my heart. Are you trying to tell me that we as a nation have not cooked up any seriously effective legislation against gun violence or climate change or any of the other myriad issues that we scientifically do have actionable solutions on the table to? Simply because people aren't willing to accept the scientific fact of what's going on because it may impact their personal politics? or their personal worldviews, or their feelings. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, I knew it. You're trying to break my heart. Next subject, please. Okay, uh, who likes the internet? I'm on the fence about the internet. Mostly it's a good thing. What do you think about dank maymays? Mostly on the fence about them. Well, I got some good and bad news for you. The Are we dank... talking about memes? Yes. The May Mays may be disappearing from the internet because Articles 11 and 13 were passed by the EU. They will be going up for adoption here. Ha 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 ha. The vote was approved 15 to 10 for Article 11 and 13 to 12 for Article 13, which, yeah, I know some complicated numbers there. I'm sorry. I love numbers. So sue me. Okay, well, don't actually sue me because I don't get any money. So you're going to be very disappointed. Basically, to kind of recap on this, so Article 11 was the creation of a link tax. Basically, the thought behind it was to prevent search engines from deep linking news articles and whatnot. But what it actually effectively does is just requires a license or an entity to pay a tax to provide a link and snippet of material. So this could effectively shut down sites like Wikipedia that describe materials within links or have to provide uh, snippets for primary sources. So it creates a problem there. Article 13, which is actually in some ways even worse, basically calls for creating a content scanning service, which copyright holders would upload material to so that uploaded material on websites could be scanned against. This includes code like you'd find on GitHub, images like memes, videos, music files, etc. Now, to our listeners in the United States and South America and the icy moon of Europa and pretty much everywhere that is not the uh, European Union, this will actually affect you because I, I don't think I need to remind everyone that content creators span the entirety of the world. Anywhere that content creators upload will be affected by this. Now, the nasty part is about this implementation is that it doesn't call for a unified impl implementation, which makes this even worse because this means that countries could band together to all create one solution or we could end up with 20 something how many ever countries are in the U eu right now implementations so as you could imagine it's probably going to be a little bit of a nightmare probably something in between but what's going to happen here is that because the eu is such a big part of the the world population services are just going to create systems that are pretty much compatible with these laws. What we end up with is a global system 
simply because of the, the global nature of the internet. Because really all it takes is one major company to create one bad law, net <laughs> neutrality, and all of a sudden the entire world's going to suffer for it. Yeah, particularly in countries like Great Britain and Germany that have a lot of companies in them that own a lot of intellectual property. Uh, think of it like this. Every company in the EU wants you to have a shot glass full of liquor. And if all of them were required to give you the same amount of liquor, drinking 20 half shots of, you know, melon liqueur probably wouldn't give you alcohol poisoning. But if a couple of those countries decide to go above and beyond because their good friends pressure them to play hardball, you're probably going to get a couple of full shot glasses of Everclear and you will have to deal with those as well as the lesser offerings of the other countries. It just means that if, say, Germany wants to do a, a blanket ban on this company's logo to hold with the metaphor, if Germany wants to give you a glass of Everclear, you're going to have to drink that too. It's going to cause some very serious problems across the board universally. Are you saying that you can down 20 shots of melon liqueur? Have you ever been to a furry con, Phelan? No, I don't have a fursuit. I've always wanted to go to one. If I have the money next year, I actually might go to, uh, to BFLC. So you guys are, will get to see me there in my not fursuit because I don't own one. I haven't been to a con since uh, before I was of legal drinking age, and I haven't been to a single con where I didn't catch alcohol poisoning, which is great. We're thinking about BLFC next year, so you might actually get to meet us. So getting back to articles 11 and 13 here, this is so severe that the inventors of the World Wide Web, Vint Cerf and Tim Berners-Lee, actually released a statement declaring that this was a danger to a free and open internet. And of course, other writers, Cory Doctorow, the Creative Commons Institution, and the EFF have all released similar statements as well. I thought Al Gore invented the internet. I don't even know what is the origin of that. I assume he passed some legislation or something that make, he thinks made it possible or some bullshit like that, right? Uh, firstly, he actually never said, I invented the internet. That is a misquote. He actually said that he passed the initiative for inventing the internet or something to that effect. And it got twisted around by right wingers on talk radio who never actually played the clip and just described it to their listeners. And so it got twisted around to Al Gore invented the internet. That's how that happened. <laughs> I thought Al Gore invented global warming. Really, I didn't realize that that was like a right wing joke in origin. It, it was, well, it was a misquote that was floating around, but apparently it started from the right wing. Big surprise there that they would misquote Al Gore to make him look stupid. But hey, uh, if the internet doesn't work out, we can always move back to BBS's. I still got my dial-up modem. Los Angeles Times wrote this great article this week. I don't know if you guys saw it. No surprise, employers are willing to do anything to find workers except pay them more. Like I said, like before the show, after my campaigning today, that it really does seem like uh, liberals are kind of waking up. I've kind of gotten that feeling, too, lately speaking to a lot of uh, more liberally people online. I'll admit, I don't really speak to a lot of liberals. I, I stay in, in, in my own circle and other circles, apparently. You guys know who you are if you're listening. Thank you. Especially if you st stayed with us this long doubly thank you for putting up with me and everybody else. No, no, uh, you know, the readers and, um, oh. yeah, they got a huge man crush on me, by the way. I could have got so much internet tell this weekend. I tell you what. They tell you what. <laughs> with this article, there, there were some very interesting facts here on this one. So what we have right now in the United States is a supposed labor shortage. Simply there are more jobs than there are people willing to fill them or able to fill them. Instead of paying more, the companies are just complaining that they have to pay more because it would cut into their profits. In fact, one analyst from Citigroup after United Airlines 
decided to pay their workers more complained labor's being paid first again shareholders get the leftover which objectively no not even kind of but beyond that it's just such a silly backwards entitled way to think it is it, factually corporate profits have went from under four percent in 1992 to about six and a half percent uh, in 2016 while at the same time labor's share dropped from 46 to 43 and it and labor's share peaked at 51.5 percent so labor's share has consistently been on a downward spiral for almost 30 years now and wages have been stagnant pretty much since the early 80s so basically this is just all guillotine talk at this point <laughs> and they'll never see it coming either this is exactly why labor does need to become organized this is why every show we say hey get out there and and organize do stuff direct action because this slide down on the wage scale this happened pretty much directly after unions were declawed in the United States ever since union membership started to sharply drop in the United States. So it is imperative for workers to work together with each other and stop trying to fight each other over crumbs. I was talking with the guy I want to vote for uh, in the primary when I was campaigning with him today, and I was basically explaining to him like, and he got it. Surprisingly, he was like 10 steps ahead of me, which is why I think there's more going on with social Democrats than I think we give them credit for. I think a lot of people running as social Democrats, oh, I'm sorry, Democratic Socialists, are much more left than we give them credit for. They just, they can't say those things to the liberals because then they'll trigger the scary words and the liberals will go running away. He, he got it. He, and he was complaining about how the, the ALF-CIO endorsed the um the corporatist real estate agent who he's running against in the primary who's the incumbent of course he did because the afl cio is at the end of the day also a, a business they they are a corporation they're a corporate union which is why in addition to our corporate unions out there which are fine and dandy and good if, if you can do that they do provide some great benefits out there for their workers. Do that. That's okay. I'm not 100% opposed to it, but I'm also not 100% for it. But also, really consider joining the IWW because even if you're part of a corporate union, you can still double card with the IWW. The only union you can't double card with with the IWW is the cop union. I was just going to say the fraternal order of plutocrat bootlickers. Going back to, to what this quote about labor being paid first, though, and the shareholders getting leftovers. He said this after United Airlines decided to pay their their employees more. You know what their shareholders did was basically try to sell off, which dropped down the share price of United Airlines. That's the kind of plutocracy that, that we are dealing with in the United States where corporations, if they do to decide to to pay their workers more, then they're going to be punished by the, the plutocrats and by, by the stockholders, etc. We have to make sure that labor in this country is strong enough to withstand that urge from these shareholders who don't give a damn about the average person. I mean, isn't that literally the point of owning a share is you get the crumbs left over after the, the, the company is done operating? When you purchase a share, you're not paying for the company to do its job. You're lending them money so that they can give you more money back when it's like a silly version of long-term government bonds, isn't it? Yeah. If the company that you invest money in is profitable, you get the bleed off of that profits when it's done paying its operating costs, which includes its employees. The employees are more entitled to that money because they are critical to making more money for you, ostensibly. You're supposed to get the breadcrumbs. That's how it's supposed to work. 
Yeah, but there was another thing that you did say when you were talking about raising the minimum wage at your work that one of your, your managers had interjected and, and said something about how people should vote and there would be consequences, which, by the way, I had that same thing happen to me and I shut my manager up, too, uh, in very kind words and told him, hey, you know, you really shouldn't tell other people how to vote in that language. It's, it's very much illegal. You had... And a very interesting explanation that I wanted to then compound on. Could you go over that with me? Well, at this point, I was like just barely getting into leftism. Most of it seemed like a lot of common sense to me and compounded upon my uh, less recent, but at that time, more recent interest in radical feminism kind of pushed me toward leftism. At the time, on, on the referendum for uh, changes that would be made on a state level, one of the things that we were supposed to vote for was whether or not to raise the Arizona minimum wage from eight twenty five an hour to ten dollars an hour. And my super libertarian manager at the time was telling my coworkers and I, he was saying, Well, you know what happens if you vote for that is inflation rises because all of these companies, they're gonna need to pay their employees more, which raises their operating prices, which means in order to cut a profit, they're gonna need to sell their products for higher. So you're gonna get that money and it's not going to mean anything because everything is going to cost the same comparatively and eventually the prices are going to raise anyway and you'll end up even poorer. So this is in the middle of a workday working on the line with a bunch of these kids who, who looked up to this guy and I was like, hey man, um, see what you're talking about right here, trying to influence the way that your subordinates vote is actually a conflict of interests and that's something if... I remember correctly, they speak very explicitly about not doing back there in manager school. So maybe if you just like couldn't, but just before we stop talking about this, I'd like to add to the conversation that it's been shown time and time again in places where the minimum wage did go up. When you pay your employees, your minimum wage employees more, they have more money and are therefore capable of spending more money. Now going from eight twenty-five to $10 an hour, is going to be a roughly 20% increase in the spending power of everyone making minimum wage, which means that everyone making minimum wage is going to buy roughly 20% more things from these companies, which means that even if they don't raise their prices at all, their profit margin is going to increase by roughly 20%. And the amount of money that they're going to be making with that 20% added on is going to dwarf the amount of money they're going to be losing adding that 20% into their employees' paychecks, which means that either way, we're going to have more spending power and they're going to be making more money even if they don't raise their prices, which they probably won't because competition in a small town like this is still something that they're going to have to contend with. And then he got all pouty and sent me home early. And the other thing is, is oftentimes the actual amount that prices would have to wait, raise due to wage inflation isn't that much. The second thing is, is that it's called exactly that. So they're talking about wage inflation, which is not a huge contributor to overall inflation. In fact, it's one of the smallest contributors to inflation. What inflation actually is, is it's an increase in the money supply. So this is literally there being more money in the monetary system. That's what that is. And because there's more money, the value of the money goes down. Usually inflation is caused by the Federal Reserve basically printing up more money or manipulating interest rates or banks changing lending policies on large scales. That's what causes inflation. Inflation is not caused by wages. That's one of those big myths and it's a big misunderstanding. The second point, and actually my second point's related to your point, a lot of capitalists don't really seem to understand how capitalism seems to work. One of the signs of a healthy economy is a high value of what is called the velocity of money. And what that means is how fast money changes hands or how often it changes hands. In economies that have high velocities, the economy is healthy and usually booming. In economies that have low velocity, where there's not much trade of hand of money, 
those economies tend to suffer. And this actually shows up in recession cycles. Before recession occurs, velocity of money starts sharply dropping in most cases. It's very rare that you'll have a recession in a time period where the velocity of money is high. Usually this happens when it slows down. So right now, the velocity of money hasn't really changed all that much in the economy. And the reason is, is because the wealthy have most of the money and aren't giving it to the workers. So the workers aren't spending as much money as they would. It's usually a bottom up process. Well, if the rich people trade huge amounts of money with one another, logically that some of that money is going to be given to merchants with less capital and then they're going to have to pay their workers who are going to use it for basic amenities you know theoretically the money should trickle down from the top we should we should try that has anyone ever tried that uh, a type of capitalist economics where the money trickles down from the top like a, like that a, ever like a golden shower i am hmm hmm like a like a Okay, pump the brakes. This is going to a dark place, a dark, smelly place. I, w I was going to say, like, like the time that Reagan gave America a nice golden shower and the economy immediately went into recession after he left in 92. It's been proven time and time again, when you do pay your workers more, the economy is healthier because people are more willing to spend on extraneous stuff, which is what keeps the economy going. And then on top of that, people could actually afford to live, which means that they live better lives. Who would have thought? But of course, capitalists run it for everybody because they simply just don't understand how their own system works and they put everybody, including themselves, in danger. It's a bit like the analogy of the eggs in the nest. You come upon a bird's nest with three eggs in it. If you take all three eggs, you'll have a nice full meal, but no little birds will turn into big birds who lay eggs and therefore the system will collapse. If you take too much and aggregate too many resources in too few hands, those resources won't move around and therefore the people who are required to move those resources into more hands more quickly and more effectively, the resources will stop moving altogether. There is a logical extreme to this, which is one person having all the money. And oh look, eight people have 40% of the money. And like we said earlier, this is why labor I, matters. I mean, you're basically describing like the basics of Keynesian economics. But moving on here, uh, we did have some Galaxy Brains of the Week, right? We actually had two of them here. Mr. John Shatner, the former CEO of Papa John, gets fired for doing the one thing that he wasn't supposed to do during a phone call on racial sensitivity. And guess what that is? So you're saying the populist Papa popped off pompously? I can't even, I'm not even going to try to repeat that. But yeah, he, he dropped the N-bomb during a freaking phone call on offensive language and topics. The context in which he did was basically Colonel Sanders said it, so I should get to say it too. It's just, it's just the entirety of slash R slash you had one job. It's, it's, it's so cartoonishly ridiculous that it's this is this is like a Saturday Night Live skit that they would never write. I'm just imagining a 14 year old white kid from an affluent family going, well, you know, exhibit says that word. Why can't I? Who's exhibit? He pimped my ride. And before that, he was a musical artist. I just know him from the show Pimp My Ride. But our second Galaxy Brain of the Week here, and because there's a lot to unpack with this one. And this is a guy, he's, he, we've talked about him. He's even been on the show a few times, actually. And we're going to bring him in so that uh, he can tell us about this. So um, what happened? Tell us about Ocasio. An admitted communist wins the New York primary, putting America on the path to complete corporate control. 
Whoa there, Alex. Whoa, you gotta, you gotta stop with that. You're, you're breaking the microphone. Can we, we need to do a skit of you <laughs> making Alex Jones and Jimmy Dore fight. I'm angry. But yeah, I mean, can we, can we unpack this? I mean, really? So admitted communist wins New York primary one. She's not a communist. She at best is a democratic socialist. She was on some PBS talk show. I forget. I think it was called like trigger fire or something. She surprised me. I could very much hear her trying not to say, try to figure out how to phrase certain Marxist things. She was one step away from saying labor theory of value. So I'm, we may be underestimating the social Democrats understandings here. Cause she seemed like she might actually be a Marxist. It definitely didn't feel like capitalism, but healthcare. So like she couldn't just come out and say, you know, capitalism is evil, whatever. Well, you're, you're not going to get that from a candidate. And I really wish people would no. understand this. But, 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 but what she did, she, she went so far as to say that capitalism is starting to not work anymore and will not work in the future. And that she pretty much said it's doomed. She pretty much was about to say, I can't, uh, the, the Marxist concept of velocity of money is when I'm the shrinking, shrinking profit, something, something. What am I thinking of? Um, you help me. You're a Marxist Leninist. Um, All the, profits the, shrink over time or something like that. Yeah. Whatever his phrase for that. I forget. I mean, she was one step away from saying this. So I'm, so I'm kind of thinking like maybe these social Democrats from, from what, what I saw her do today on PBS and what I, when I was talking to my preferred candidate that they might they might know something they might have a few books that uh aren't aren't on their bookshelf for the public to see no i've been mean, thinking the same thing too thinking, i mean they're still kind of pretty much reformists but you know i who knows if there'll be a revolution coming out of them or not but you know they might still have the underpinnings of we need to reform away from capitalism or whatever but i think we might be underestimating them but Venezuela. You, you know, for, for every argument of Venezuela, I will trade you a, a, a Bolivia. Go, go look up what they've been doing in Bolivia for about 10 years now. And it, pretty much same kind of Bol Bolivarian socialism, but implemented right. And the country is, has worked. I mean, there, there, there's variables obviously involved in everything. You know, and of course, I know you're joking. But... No, my de facto response to Venezuela will forever be, we just want healthcare, babe. You people have worms in your brains. I know exactly what you're referencing. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing here, so I had to, to mute the microphone. Just the obnoxiousness of Alex Jones's claim getting back to this. So, admitted communist. Okay, so, so what if she is? And then let's put the second part here. Putting America on the path to complete corporate control. Um, wait a second here. Wouldn't that be fascism one and two? Isn't that pretty much what the right wants to do anyway? Sorry, involuntary corporate control. How's that, not different than different than, how's that not different than today? I mean, we pretty much got involuntary corporate control. I mean, so... No, 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 no one's putting a gun to your head. You can opt out. You don't have to have a job. Do you understand that? No, you don't have to have a job. It is not compulsory capitalism. You can opt out. No one has a gun to your head. And if you ever think any differently, remember, Venezuela... That is, that's, that's always the argument they give, too. And they're so easily disproven. Animal Farm! 1984! And the best part is, George Orwell, in, I think, shoot, like, 87, he said, you know, if I had been paying more attention at the time to what they were protesting, I would have sided with the anarchists. It, uh, all Animal Farm is, is the revolution betrayed the novel. Okay, Trotsky. I'm sorry, I'm I'm a bit too tired. Can you just can you like ape my spiel about how I love you all and I have great hope for this movement and I really seriously hope that we all just fucking join unions and actually speak to one another like human beings? Yes, I can. So thank you all for listening tonight. We we love you. 
and uh, go out there and become uh, anarcho-syndicalists or communists or whatever. And if you liked our podcast, share it, like it, subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter. We're at Enceladus1. Uh, we post great stuff there uh, during the week. We uh, we post some breaking news articles if there's something major. We also post some great puns there. So you guys will love it, especially if you like dad humor. Check it out. And of course, we always post the latest episode up there. It's the best way to also get a hold of uh, us if you do want to contact us. And keep an eye on our Twitter because we will be making some very, very major announcements there pretty soon. I know I keep teasing it, but a lot of work so thank you guys i love you all take care good night and good luck